The Miracle of Mercy David and Saul This is David. Hey! David was a shepherd who lived in Israel. David was chosen by God to be the next king of Israel when he was just a boy. But David had to wait a very long time until that promise would come true because there was another king of Israel named Saul. Saul was strong and tall and looked like everything a king should be. But Saul did not follow God like he was supposed to. And for that reason, God chose to take the kingdom from Saul's family and give it to David's. David became a great warrior. Ah! And everyone in the kingdom loved David. Huh? This made Saul jealous, and Saul hated David because he thought he would try to kill him and take the throne from his family. So Saul wanted to kill David. Whoa! Saul hunted David, but he couldn't catch him. One day, Saul heard that David was in the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul gathered 3,000 of his skilled fighters and went to find and kill David. During Saul's search for David, he went in a cave to relieve himself. Well, this very cave was the one where David and his men were hiding. And when David's men saw that Saul was unaware that David was there and unable to defend himself, they said, Now's your chance, David. This is God telling you that he will give you your enemy to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of Saul's robe. But then David began to think that it was not right for him to take Saul's life. For no matter how much hardship and difficulty Saul had caused him, it was still not right for him to hurt the one who God had placed over Israel. So David told his men to back off, and he did not let them kill King Saul. They waited until after Saul had left the cave. And then David ran out of the cave and shouted after Saul, My king! Why do you listen to people who say I am trying to harm you? Look, I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I am not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you've been hunting me. David went on to promise that he would never harm Saul. David said that God would be the one to protect David and to rescue him from Saul's power. Saul said, Is that really you, David? And he began to cry. Saul said, you are a better man than I. You have been amazingly kind to me today, for when God put me in a place where you could have killed me, you didn't do it. Who else would have done this? And now I realize that you are surely going to be king, and the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. But promise me that when that happens, you will not kill my family. So David promised that he would not hurt Saul's family, and they left each other in peace. Now Saul continued to cause difficulty in David's life. But David kept his promise and in time, David did become king of Israel. David was dearly loved by God and Israel did flourish under his rule because David did everything that God wanted him to do and he was a man after God's own heart. So we're just asking a bunch of different kids, if you got to meet God face to face, what questions would you ask him? Mm, why did God make me so good at football? Where would he sleep every night? How were the planets formed? How do you make the clouds? Why do I have hair? Why do we have hair? Is there sharks in heaven? Why is Hippo so fat? Does Jesus and God ever get weepy? Why can't I just play sports all day? What's your mom's name? 
if he lives with anyone. Why do armpits smell? <laughs> Why do we have brain freeze when we eat, um, when we drink th cold things too fast? How much Christmases has you been alive? Why do we have to read so much at school? Why does my family have to be so loud? Why are cheetahs so fast? Why are cheetahs so fast? Why do brothers and sisters fight a lot? What did the world used to look like once there was nothing there? How old is he? How old is God? Why can't we have world peace? If I could see the past when Jesus was on earth. Where did he come from? Why did he name a Jesus Jesus? How long did you live on earth? What was your favorite part of your life? I would ask him if he could remove sin from all of the earth. Can you make people nice to each other? Where were you before heaven was made? How was God made? How was Satan created? If I can learn more about him. Why were we made with sin? How is there no beginning or no end to God? Does everyone go to heaven? What is it like in heaven with you? When is Jesus coming back? Why is your heart so big? And I think that's all. Let's pray together. Jesus, it's just so true. It's all about you. That's why we've gathered here together today is to worship you, to bring honor to your name. You indeed are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we bow to you today as our King. We thank you that you care about the things that we care about more deeply than we do. We pause today and we think of those that we know that need a healing touch from you. And we pray, O oh God, that you would do that. Whether it be physical healing or emotional healing, God, may we remember that we can cry out to you and that you do hear our prayers and you answer them. We pray today for those that are mourning. We pray that you would be with them that your hand would be upon them and that they would know that you are there and that you care for them. And Father, you know the beginning from the end. Sometimes it's so hard for us to, to understand that, to comprehend that, and yet it is so true. Father, we thank you mostly that you, that you are here with us even right now where we are at, whether it be in this building, whether it be in a car, whether it be in our home, you are there with us. Your word tells us that you will never leave us and you'll never forsake us. We are so grateful for that. Father, I pray that as Pastor Jody opens your word this morning, that you would help us to have receptive ears to what is being said. We pray that you would speak through her to us today. May we be overwhelmed once again by your word and how applicable it is to us and how it challenges us and how it shapes us and makes us into the people that we ought to be. We pray that you would help us today to not just be hearers of your word, but we would be doers of it as well. That whatever we, wherever we go, we would be a shining example of you to the people around us. And we will give you praise and glory for you alone are worthy of that. Thank you again for being with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Brian. Have a seat. Well, I'm going to take a 
page out of the Ian Isaac book of preaching, and we're going to have a little bit of fun, and we're going to do an interactive game. I've never done this before. I'm a tiny bit nervous because uh, there's a lot of moving parts going on, but I want to play a word association game, and so it's going to be a studio audience, but it's also going to be for those uh, viewers at home, and so what I want you to do, so viewers at home, we'll start with you. Uh, what I want you to do is I want you to text me. My number is 891-6899. And I want you to give me a text. And I want you to shoot me a text. Um, the first thing that comes to your mind when I say February. And uh, so just, and if you wouldn't do, uh, if you do me a favor by putting like an F in front of it so I know which, I'm going to ask you two questions. <laughs> I don't want to get them mixed up, although that might make for some comedy. Uh, but so people at home. Uh, the first thing, and I'll read the text, and I, I probably won't read all of them, uh, but just as an idea, first thing that pops in your mind when you, when you, you hear the word February. All right, studio audience. <laughs> what is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word February? Keith? <laughs> warmer weather. <laughs> There's a man of hope. Awesome. Uh, oh, my phone is just lighting up. That's awesome. All right. Who, Ramona? Valentine's Day. Mom? My mom and Keith's birthday. Oh, what did you say? Your mom and my dad's birthday? Oh, I didn't know it was grandma's birthday. <laughs> and Taka's birthday. Awesome. <laughs> this is great. Anybody over here? First thing comes to mind, Febu uh, February. Cold, yes. February is very, very cold. All right, so let's see. Uh, I've got a bunch of messages coming in. All right, let's see. Uh, oh, my goodness, face ID. <laughs> Open up already. How come it says that? I told you this was going to be a bit of gong show. All right, goodness, I need, a, I need help. All right. Aw, very nice. <laughs> These are private things. Okay, Evelyn Solacy says, uh, more sunshine. Cherith Alexander, Valentine's Day. Phyllis Love, Groundhog Day. Uh, Tim is busy texting me a story. Um, Greg and Tracy, Feb freeze. Freezing, that's what... Uh, Aw, apparently Shana Swedberg's birthday is on February 14th. And Tim is still texting. <laughs> I cannot wait to read that. Uh, let's see. Donald Alexander, cold. First thing that comes to mind. Me too. And Clark Gordon, spring is closer. Well, I can't wait to read the rest of those. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what comes to my mind is uh, February. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind are... Uh, when Jeff proposed to me. So I think of Boston pizza and heart-shaped pizzas. I think of a drive to a little park and an engagement ring. So that's what comes to my mind. All right. Different question, same deal though. I'll, I'll ask, I'll put it out there to um, people to text me, 891-6899. First thing that comes to mind when you hear the words or the phrase Psalm 23. I want you to go ahead and if you could just put a, a P in front of your text and that way I'll know that, <laughs> that Psalm 23 doesn't remind you of, of cold or groundhogs. <laughs> Ah, all right, studio audience. Psalm 23, what are some of the first things that pop into your mind? Sorry, rest? Yeah, Shelly said rest. No fear, Ramona said. Shepherd, Mum said. Still waters, Norm, that comes to Norm's mind. Anybody else? Psalm 23, oh, they're lighting up. Oh. So Laurel uh, remembers memorizing Psalm 23 at Bible camp. All right, let's check in with, oh my goodness, with technology that always works so great. Um, let's see. Cherith said uh, contentment. Uh, <laughs> Donald says it's on the fridge. Um, <laughs> Shelly Koff says it's soothing. Phyllis Love says sheep. Um, oh, Kaylin Fredette said David's harp. Um, Lisa Mallory says peace. Um, somebody said a skidoo trip, so I don't know which, <laughs> I don't know which answer that was. <laughs> 
oh, I cannot thank you for playing along and texting me, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't read all of them out, uh, but I love that you, that you answered, and uh, I miss you folks. I wish we were all here in the room together. Um, here's here's, here's uh, when I think of Psalm 23, this is what I think of. And so this little church that's on the screen behind me is the Main Center Mennonite Brethren Church. And it's in Saskatchewan. And I lived there when I was six years old. And so I had a school teacher by the name of Mrs. Jansen. And she and her husband would come in a great big car and pick me up and drive me to Sunday school. And it was in the basement of this little church. And (laughs) I don't know if you could see, like, I, I said last night, the, the picture on, on your left, it looks, like, it looks like I went to church in Walnut Grove. I mean, trust me, I'm not that old, but <laughs> unfortunately, it's a, it's a little hamlet of a town, and not many people live there, and I don't think, hey, obviously, no one's keeping up the church, but it was in this church way back in, uh, in 1970-something that I went to Sunday school, and I learned that at Sunday school, when it was your birthday, you got a special pencil. And I very, couldn't wait for my birthday so I could get a, a pencil. And uh, at the Sunday school, they had a little globe, and we would pray uh, for people that lived completely on the different side of the world. And we learned really groovy songs like, Stop and let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. And it was also, just like Laurel at Bible Camp, it was also the place where I learned Psalm 23. And uh, so when I think of Psalm 23, I I think of memorizing it when I was six years old in the basement of this little country church. And we're going to spend a few weeks in this psalm, and I've, I learned a ton. Like I said, it's been a long time that I was six years old. And so, um, I'm really surprised at the, some of the things that I learned about this psalm this week, you know, some many years later. Um, and I can't wait for you to learn the things that I did. But I'm going to ask the folks in the room to stand with me. We're going to read the psalm together. And um, just for nostalgia's sake, or uh, we're going to read it in the way that I memorized it in the King James Version. So a few folks would stand with me, and let's read Psalm 23. And folks at home, of course, you can read along as well. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. Please be seated. And Lord, as Brian has already prayed, I pray that we would hear from you whatever you want us to learn about this beautiful, beautiful psalm. In your name, amen. So we'll just go back to, and I'll turn my phone this way so that I don't get distracted by it. (laughs) Let's go back to the word association game just for a minute. So when thinking about Psalm 23, some of you said uh, peaceful. Um, I don't know if I heard rivers. Um, I heard... um, sheep and just just a real sense of calm and uh, and so maybe some of you pictured uh, something that looks like what this photo behind me looks like so yeah when I used to think of Psalm 23 I would think of sheep standing in in belly deep alfalfa with a babbling brook not too far off it's a pleasant and it's a very comforting image and it's probably why Psalm 23, when I'm meeting with families and we're, uh, we're planning funerals, often p- 
people will say, oh, could we have Psalm 23? Because this, this psalm just brings so much comfort, so much peace in this psalm. But here's what I learned this week. So before David was a king, and before he was hunted down by his arch enemy Saul, David was a shepherd, we all know that. And no one knows for sure when this psalm was written, and no one knows for sure the exact circumstance. But I think it's safe to assume that the scripture was written by David as an adult, and he was reflecting back on his days, um, what it was like to be a shepherd. And this is the place where David would have been shepherding his sheep. Scripture tells us that David did his shepherding uh, from the wilderness near Bethlehem. And the sheep grazing areas in Israel, they were mostly this dry, desert-like conditions. It was rocky. Um, The sheep were taken far away from any agricultural land. It seemed like the agricultural land uh, was close to the cities or close to the towns. And there wasn't a lot of farmable land. And so the last thing um, grain producers wanted was a bunch of sheep and goats trampling on on their crops. And so they would take, they would ask the shepherds to take the sheep far away into the wilderness. And so the sheep and goats, uh, yeah, they would run around in this, in this really steep, um, dry terrain. It's also likely that this kind of wilderness that you see is where David wrote his psalms. Scripture tells us that David was hiding from Saul. Saul was, he was bent on killing him. And so he hid in an area of steep and dangerous cliffs and canyons. And it is believed that while he was hiding in some of these places, he reflected on what it was like uh, in in his youth. And and anyway, he would write, he would write these psalms. And it's likely that he was looking at this kind of terrain when he was writing Psalm 23. Now, this past week, I learned some interesting things about the Hebrew language. Now, I did go to Bible school, but I wasn't in the track as uh, some of my MDiv friends. They were working towards the Masters of Divinity. Uh, I was working on a different degree, my MRS degree. And, uh, but I'm very grateful. So anyway, I didn't have to go to Hebrew or Greek classes. I saw my friends just slaving over flashcards in the library all the time. I was, I was glad that I didn't have to do that. Uh, but I am glad and grateful for what I learned through some commentaries this week about the Hebrew language. And I am also very glad that the Lord steered me back into this path anyway. The Hebrew, uh, Hebrew was the language that the Bible was written in, and especially the Old Testament. And because we speak English, there are some things that we miss occasionally. And so we're going to, it's going to be kind of quick, but it's going to be a little bit like, why are you telling me this? Just hang with me. There's there's a real good reason why I'm telling you what I'm going to tell you now. The word desert or wilderness in the Hebrew is midbar. And... um, yeah, when they would talk about, you know, going out into, like, the picture behind me, the, the, the wilderness of the Negev or the, you know, the desert area be, you know, behind Bethlehem where David would have been shepherding, uh, it would have been a midbar. So the word speak is very similar. It's spelled a bit different in English, like the, the English spelling of the Hebrew word, but it's pronounced very similar Uh, They have the same root. So uh, to speak in Hebrew is medbar. So desert is midbar. Speak is medbar. They have the same root, and that's why they kind of sound similar in our ears. So I learned that there is also another word of the same origin. So the phrase holy of holies is devere. I'm not probably pronouncing that right either, but when we use all of these uh, words in English, uh, we paint a different picture for each of them. So if we were playing Pictionary and, and you got the card desert, 
you would draw something very different than somebody else who got the card for speak. And then if somebody else, I don't know what you would draw if you got the card holy of holies, but I suspect your card, the desert might have, you know, you might draw a picture of a cactus. If you got the card speak, you might draw a, a person, like a side profile of a person with some kind of um, marks, you know, suggesting speaking, and holy of holies, like I said, I don't know what you would draw for that. But in English, all three of these words, we, have, we conjure up a very, very different picture that comes to our brain. But in Hebrew, all of these words have the same root. It's devar. So if you were an Old Testament Hebrew person and you were playing a word association game, and um, if, you, if, if you drew speak or desert or holy of holies, the picture that would come to your mind would be the same thing. You would draw something that describes a place where God speaks. So to speak, a place where God speaks, desert, a place where God speaks, holy of holies, place where God speaks. Throughout scripture, I want to focus a little bit on the desert part. Throughout scripture, we find men and women hearing from God in the wilderness. To be in the wilderness, to be in the desert, was was meant for those folks that, that, you know, probably, just maybe, but, but likely, they would hear from the Lord. There was a lady by the name of Hagar, and she was forced to leave the camp because her mistress was treating her very poorly. She was uh, she was the servant, and she was being treated poorly. And so she left, and she went into the wilderness. There, the Lord met her and spoke to her and gave her this incredibly important message: God hears. When Moses spoke from to uh, when Moses spoke with God in the form of the burning bush, of course it was in the wilderness. God took Moses out into the wilderness in order to speak to him. John the Baptist, he lived in the wilderness, that was his home and and the Lord spoke to him often there and he, and he heard this message, prepare the way for the Lord. And he brought that message to everyone. Even Jesus, our Savior, he went out into the desert or the wilderness on purpose so that he could hear from God, so that God could speak to him. Throughout scripture, there's, you'll just see this over and over again. God meets his people in the desert and he speaks with them. It's in these wilderness places that God is most prevalent. So what's, what's this got to do with Psalm 23? Well, I just wanted to set the stage for us. And I I, I apologize if I have blown up your uh, image of, you know, green pastures and brooks. Um, But I think it's important for us to realize that David was not writing these encouraging words while looking out at a serene landscape and enjoying a cold drink. He was smack dab in the middle of a desert in the middle of the wilderness. And I suspect his life was upside down when he wrote this psalm. And yet, the words begin, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. For us modern day followers, we try to avoid the desert, don't we? In fact, If you've ever gone through a desert season where you just feel like you can't connect with God or you you feel like you're you're struggling with with something or you're frustrated, you know, it's often as Westerners, we either think one of two things. We think, well, maybe maybe God isn't caring and not hearing. Or probably more likely, we think, what's wrong with us? Like, why can't I get this right? There's something wrong with me. I shouldn't be in this desert. We, we try to avoid the desert at all cost. We don't like it when life is hard and dry and when we feel isolated. 
When we're not surrounded by lush blessings, we interpret it as either God's punishment or his apathy. But David didn't. David knew something that us Westerners haven't figured out. God speaks in the desert. David knew that he didn't have to worry about being in this desert because his shepherd would provide everything he needed. We'll do a little bit of another word association, and, and this will just remain in your, in your noggin. When you picture your life right now, your day-to-day, your week-to-week, month-to-month life right now, what's the first thing that pops to your mind? What's the first image or what's the first word that you would describe your life? Maybe, for some, your life is full and satisfying and peaceful. And if that describes you, I just think that's great. Enjoy that and, and go find somebody and encourage somebody. But maybe, maybe some of your picture that pops into your head looks a little bit more like the wilderness. Uncertain, frightening, empty, frustrating. Typically in Canada, when we're in seasons like this, we want to get out as soon as possible. Desert seasons, as I said, we try to avoid them at all costs. But what if the people of the Bible were right. What if it's in the desert when God speaks? You know, I've been thinking about this longer than you folks have, obviously, because I've been preparing for today. Um, but here's something that, because of what I learned, that has really been working for me this past week. It's, it's a new way of thinking about things. So, you know, it's tempting to think about the, the hard stuff, stuff in life and, and ask ourselves the question, when? When can I get out of this desert? And there's, there's nothing wrong with that question. David himself wrote a different psalm, and it said, How long? How long, O oh Lord? How long will I struggle? How long will I struggle with this marriage stuff, the stuff that's really hard in my marriage? How long will I be sick? How long will my loved one be sick? How long will I struggle with this sin? How long will these COVID restrictions last? How long, oh Lord? When can I get out of this desert? There's nothing wrong with that question, but I want to I give you another one as well. What if, when you think about your current situation, instead of asking God, when? When can I get out of this desert? Can I encourage you to ask, what? What can I get out of this desert? Maybe this is a time in your life that feels kind of dry and desert-like, and it's tempting to focus on the things that we lack or the things that have been taken from us. But speaking from experience... When, when we run the risk of becoming hard, fruitless people, the kind of people that aren't fun to be around, the kind of people that aren't fun to live with, when we're just focused on those surroundings. But if we open ourselves up to the idea that God speaks in the wilderness, we'll, see, we'll begin to see his vo- hear his voice. Really cool things can happen. I am running out of time, but I I did want to just share something personally. So I remember uh, a really particularly difficult time here in our church family, and I'm not going to go into details, but it was a very complicated time. And um, I just, there were a lot of things that was going on, and I I really did feel, um, as I said, confused, and it was complicated, and, and I felt hurt. And I remember I phoned up Luann Akins, and I was just pouring out my heart to her. And I said, and, and she said, Jody, I know what you need to do. You need to hang up the phone. 
You need to ignore the kids, ignore making supper, put on a worship CD, and worship your face off. You can just hear her saying that, hey? And so I did it. I took her advice because uh, Luann is, is someone who knows the Lord well. And what, when she tells me to do stuff, I should probably do it. And I remember uh, just listening. Alone, I was alone in my bedroom, and I was listening to a Hillsong worship CD. And, and then I just had this, this, this idea, this image, this, this thought that kind of popped through over my brain. And I've learned that that's how God speaks to me. And this image was uh, of me being like a wedding planner. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Wedding Planner with Jennifer Lopez, but it was that, that kind of an image, right? I mean, me with a clipboard uh, getting the bride ready. And, you know, brides can be kind of cantankerous. <laughs> uh, they, they, they're not always cooperative. And sometimes it's hard. But it's always worth it when you see that bride walking down the aisle and just everything is beautiful and she's going to her groom. And the Lord in that desert time, the Lord spoke to me and said, it's okay, Jody. It's going to be hard sometimes, but I, I'm right here and you've, and you've got a job to do. And, you know, there were a lot of other things that happened during that season. That, and that very much felt like a desert season. It felt like the relationships I had were dry and brittle. And it, it was a confusing and um, just not a great time. But there were a lot of really cool things that happened in that season. And I heard the Lord speak. And, and I suspect if we started telling stories in this room or if you listening were able to share your stories... I suspect the time that you heard the Lord, the Lord the most was not when you were just having a fantastic season of life. It was probably more in a desert time. The Lord says um, beautiful things to us in, in desert times. The Lord speaks in the wilderness. And I just want to encourage you, the Lord is your shepherd. You have everything you need. And instead of resisting whatever desert you may be in, instead of just focusing on all the stuff that's just right in front of you, maybe ask the question, what can I get out of this desert? Will you pray with me? Lord, I want to thank you for what you've taught us through your word. I want to thank you that um, this, this psalm applies to us um, when things are going great, but it's extra meaningful when things, when we do feel like we're in the wilderness. Thank you for the comfort it brings. And Lord, we invite you to speak into our lives this coming up week. Help us to trust you with all of our heart. In your name, amen. We may lose the radio, but I do want to finish our time together uh, with a song. Uh, this song, the title of it is Speak, O Lord. And so you can remain seated while, while I sing it, while we sing it together. Uh, and the reason is, I, I just want you to lean into that, maybe into that question. What, what can I get out of this desert instead of when? And so I, I invite you to use this time to pray, to reflect on some of the things that maybe struck a chord with you uh, today. Uh, you're welcome to sing along with me, of course. Um, but this song is intended just to give you a little extra time to think about what your heart heard. Uh, so that, because I know how it works. The minute we're done, we, we kind of, out of sight, out of mind, right? So this song is intended to help you just reflect and talk to God if you need to.
And this comes from Matthew 6, and I'm going to read it from the message version. And I love the very first uh, word of it, steep. So I want you to think back to Rebecca's um, object lesson, right? So she took a big uh, head of purple cabbage, and she boiled it, and she steeped that cabbage in water until the water was just permeated with that purple liquid. That's the idea behind this passage. So this is, this is the benediction I want to leave you with. Steep your life in God reality. Steep your life in God initiative, in God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all of your everyday human concerns will be met when you steep your life in him.
shepherd, I shall not want. 